Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Nirav Shah, the director of the Maine CDC. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's briefing on the COVID-19 situation across the state of Maine. If I could first ask uh, that everyone please mute their line. Uh, after I'm done providing an update, we will call on the folks uh, who have registered. Robert Long, our communications director, will call on the folks who have registered uh, in order to provide time to ask questions. But in the meantime, if, if you could please mute your line, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, we will go ahead and start with today's update uh, on the COVID-19 situation across the state. As of this morning, Maine CDC is reporting now 211 cases of COVID-19 statewide. Uh, this represents an increase of 43 cases since yesterday. Uh, this increase is concerning, uh, and it's one reason we wanted to brief everyone over the weekend. It is, however, consistent with the in in anticipated increase in cases as the spread of COVID-19 continues both in terms of number as well as in geography. Well, one of the things that I wanted to draw attention to today is that at least three dozen healthcare workers have now tested positive for COVID-19. And I, I ask that we keep these healthcare workers high in our thoughts. Uh, nationwide, as millions of people are staying home to prevent the transmission of COVID-19, I think it's important that we realize that healthcare workers cannot do that. As millions of people are staying home, healthcare workers are in fact doing the opposite. Uh, they are going to work while many uh, are staying home. And for that, I commend them for, for their continued uh, diligence and their continued heroism here. Uh, as of right now, there have been 41 individuals who have been hospitalized. I, I also wanted to pause there just to note that that number of hospitalized individuals is the number of individuals who have ever been hospitalized during the course of their COVID-19 illness. It's not the number who are currently hospitalized. We're tabulating that figure as well, but the 41 number is the number who have been hospitalized at any point during their COVID-19 illness. In addition, Maine CDC is reporting 36 individuals who have now recovered and been released from isolation. And finally, one individual, as we've noted, who sadly has passed away with COVID-19. Overall, Maine CDC has fielded 3,675 consultations from healthcare workers and individuals across the state uh, as, since our activation has begun. I also wanted to note uh, one, one addition with respect to community transmission. You may have seen on the website that there are now 10 cases of COVID-19 that have been confirmed in Penobscot County. Uh, consistent with our definition for what constitutes community transmission, there are two pieces. The first is a minimum of 10 cases, and the other is 25% of which that don't have what we call an epilink or an epidemiological connection to another known case or travel from an area with known cases. At this time in Penobscot County, although we have identified 10 individuals, we have not satisfied that second threshold of 25% not, uh, not having an epidemiological link. Our investigation is underway and that may change. When it does, we will update everybody. But I just wanted to clarify that for those who saw the 10 in Penobscot County on the website. I'd also like to provide an update on the laboratory testing uh, at our laboratory in, here in Augusta. Uh, the laboratory is working in full operation this weekend, uh, and we have been working quite diligently to try to reduce the number of tests that are outstanding. Uh, as I've mentioned, we have had to focus our testing on the highest risk individuals to make sure that their healthcare providers were able to receive a positive or a negative result, which could change their clinical management. That being said, we've also received reagents. These are the chemicals that help the reactions that drive the test operate and go. We have received additional supplies of reagents. And as a result of that, we have been able to reduce this testing backlog from about 1,300 cases to 826 yesterday. 
I say that because Maine CDC and our laboratory are working to reduce the backlog from both ends. One end is within the Maine CDC laboratory itself, where we are using the additional capacity that we've received to try to trim the backlog. The other end is working with a commercial laboratory to try to have them assist us in reducing the backlog even further. And then the third end is the acquisition of a new testing platform, a piece of equipment that will allow us to conduct the test. That piece of equipment has been ordered and we are waiting to hear from the manufacturer as to when they might anticipate shipping it, when we might receive it. So again, Maine CDC is working to reduce that backlog in three different ways. One is within our laboratory itself to run as many of those tests as we can. The second is by working with a commercial laboratory. And then the third is by ordering additional equipment to allow us to continue testing at a high rate. We don't feel that this backlog is acceptable in any way, and that's why we're devoting a significant amount of our team's time and energy toward trying to keep it as low as possible. The last thing I wanted to note, again, is the commitment that Maine people, and particularly today, to shine a spotlight on healthcare workers and the commitment that they've shown toward assisting with the overall COVID-19 effort. So I've mentioned healthcare workers are going to work at a time when many folks are staying home, and I want to commend them for that. A few days ago, I also asked certain groups of healthcare workers, especially those with expertise in managing critically ill patients, especially those on ventilators, to sign up to join part of the volunteer force that may be needed in the event that COVID-19 takes hold. These are groups like anesthesiologists, nurse anesthetists, critical care specialists. Within the first day of making that request, we had close to 200 new individuals who registered at mainresponds.org. And as of yesterday afternoon, we had about 300 total individuals who have stepped up and stepped forward to be part of our response team if that were to be needed. I wanna thank each and every one of those individuals for signing up via Maine Responds. As a footnote, this does not mean that there are yet 300 people who could be deployed today. That's the first step in the process of verifying their credentials, getting them fully up to speed and trained. But it does show that when asked, healthcare workers in Maine, and in fact, all Maine people are willing to, uh, to, to, to follow the call to, to assist in this broader effort as asked. And we continue working with those groups. In fact, just right before this call, I, met, I had a virtual meeting with a group of anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists to organize them to have them be part of our effort if and when they were needed to be. Uh, so with that, I'd like to pause and now uh, I turn things over to Robert for questions. Uh, I know that uh, folks who have been on the phone during our live in-person briefings haven't had as much opportunity, so we want to provide opportunities today uh, for questions and follow-up. So, Robert, I'll turn it over to you. I'll start with one, and then I'll open the lines up. Uh, this is from the Machias Valley News Observer. Uh, one of our local schools has shifted their students' work protocol away from packets of paper and advised teachers to set aside all student papers that they have received for three to four days to avoid contamination. Other schools are continuing to use the paper products for school work. Could the CDC comment on best practices for school paper handling? Uh, you know, the, the question that, that, we, that we've received a lot of questions over the past few weeks over uh, how the virus lives on surfaces, whether that's paper products, plastic bags, and others. And I will say that there's a lot of research that's ongoing about this right now. Uh, based on what we know today, right now, the latest research and the latest recommendations from the CDC suggest that the viability of this virus on surfaces may be, uh, the virus may be viable for several hours. It may be detectable for several hours on a surface. But I think that that conclusion of some of the research papers really needs to be unpacked with several really important qualifications. The first is that most, most all of the studies that have been done so far look at the viability of the virus in perfect laboratory conditions. And 
real life is the furthest thing from a perfect laboratory condition there is. The other thing is that many of those studies are just looking at whether there are any trace elements, any of the RNA or the, the fingerprints of the virus that are detectable. That's not the same as a living virus that's able to infect people. That's where the research is focused right now. It's not so much on whether there are fingerprints on the surfaces, but real, actual, living virus that can infect people. Based on what we know right now, it doesn't appear to be a high risk from transmission from surface to surface, but especially on surfaces like paper. But all the research is not yet in. And so schools and others are taking different strategies as they see fit to protect students. In a world where all the research is not yet in, all the questions are still being answered. Uh, every every school uh, is, is taking a different approach, and I understand that. Brianna Byers, do you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, do you think that you could maybe touch back on about the 10 cases in Penobscot, um, if, if if that is community transmission or not? Okay, great. So, Brianna, I, thank you for asking that. To be really clear, yeah. the even though uh, the, the way that we define when community transmission is occurring is two criteria. Uh, the first is that there must be a minimum of 10 cases in the county. And then the second is that at least 25% of those cases, if not more, have to, be, have to not have any linkage to either a known case or to travel from a part of the world where it's known to be circulating. Both of those criteria have to be met before we declare that community transmission is occurring. Right now in Penobscot, we know that we've met the first criteria, that there are at least 10 cases. The investigation right now into those 10 individuals though, uh, is underway, which means that our disease detectives, our gumshoe epidemiologists are out there on the phone, rather chatting with folks to learn where they've been, who they've been in contact with, uh, where they may have recently returned from travel. In the coming days, we'll have a better sense of whether that 25% threshold is met. Perhaps it will, perhaps it won't. I can't speculate on that. But I just wanted to provide that update because, A, I want to give a glimpse into how our investigation proceeds. And also, because that number is on the website, I didn't want anyone to jump to any conclusion. So the investigation is underway. And once we have more facts, I will keep everyone updated. Thank you. You bet. Matt Byrne. Yes, Matt. hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you so much. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Matt. Hi there. Uh, can you please expand on uh, the capacity of the out-of-state lab? Where is this lab? How much uh, bandwidth does it have? Uh, are there any secondary delays in getting the testing samples to that laboratory? How has that process worked? How long has that relationship been in play? Great. Great, ha happy to do so. So we are we are following a model that a couple of other states uh, have have also been investigating. Uh, we're working with a large commercial laboratory. Uh, I I can I, it's it, we're working with LabCorp, large commercial laboratory, um, and um, their capacity when they first went online was approximately twenty thousand per day. I, I want to be very clear. Um, I haven't looked at what their current daily capacity testing is. That was their capacity when they first went online. I would refer you to LabCorp uh, to, to get the latest on what their daily testing throughput capacity is. Um, and, and then in terms of the, the logistics, uh, we've been working or we are working with a shipping company that is, 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 is uh, qualified and skilled in this type of medical shipment, and they are able to transfer it to the depot that LabCorp has not too far uh, from, from Augusta, and then LabCorp will transfer it to their main testing site in another state where all the testing is being done. Uh, LabCorp has reported that uh, as their volume has increased, their turnaround time has slowed down. Uh, so I don't have a great estimate from them as to what the return time will be. Uh, once I get a better sense of that, uh, we'll, we'll report back to you. Usually in these situations, once the specimens have arrived at their laboratory, that's when they'll give us an estimate as to what the turnaround time will be. So as a follow-up, uh, has there been a batch of tests 
dispatched to LabCorp and have those results not come in yet? And if that's the case, uh, on what day were those tests uh, shipped or, or dispatched to LabCorp's uh, possession? Yep. So the, the, the tests are being batched. At, uh, it, there's a process called accessioning. So what LabCorp has required us to do is to fill out what is called a requisition form for each and every separate sample. Uh, they were not willing to just do a global requisition for all of our samples. So we've had a team of, of folks from Maine CDC who were deployed there and were very, very flexible with their work to help requisition into LabCorp system every single one of the samples. They've been working long hours and weekends to do that. Uh, and so the, the, ship, the, the samples will be shipped down to LabCorp in the next day or so. And how many tests are those going to be? Approximately 800. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Joe Glauber? Yes, thank you. Hi, doctor. Uh, just curious as to whether you had um, any estimate as to the average amount of time in between uh, when people have been uh, tested uh, for COVID-19 and when they actually hear or get their results. Sure. So uh, it, it does vary based on the clinical picture. Uh, and so certain, certain individuals who may, say, for example, be in critical care, uh, their, their tests are ones that, we, that their doctors need a response on quicker. So it does vary based on the clinical picture and the, the risk level of any particular patient. So for some individuals who are critically ill for whom the doctors need a quick response, we have been able to turn those responses back, in one case, even within the same day, uh, where it really would change the clinical decision that the treating physicians would make. Uh, for other individuals, uh, I, 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 I understand that there have been slower turnaround times, not just at our laboratory, but even at some of these commercial laboratories that I've mentioned. Uh, for them, the turnaround time may be several days. Uh, we, we've heard reports uh, of individuals either from our laboratory or from the commercial laboratories, Quest, LabCorp, and others uh, who have had to wait anywhere from four or even, even longer days. So again, that's not where the system should be, but it is something that is speeding up. Uh, just, just a week ago, there were reports of individuals who were waiting 10 to 14 days. Uh, so as more and more testing capacity comes online, there will be a faster turnaround time as well. Dr. Shah, this is a question that came in through email. Of the three dozen or so healthcare workers who've tested positive, do you have any information about how many may have been infected through work versus through the community? Great. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. That's part of our investigatory process. Uh, what, what we know is as community transmission occurs and becomes more common across the country, across the state, making that determination will be difficult. Uh, there, was, there was some data that just came out from the CDC about individuals in long-term care facilities and where in the setting of community transmission, determining whether it was a, uh, whether a healthcare worker was acquired or became infected outside of the hospital versus in the hospital is a challenge. But what I will say is that another set of data from Italy suggested that the rate of infection, the risk of infection for healthcare workers, is, it, it can be quite high. Uh, this one paper from Italy suggested rates uh, for certain healthcare workers that were well upwards of 15%. Uh, and and that, that, that paper needs to be reviewed. There are a lot of qualifications there. But the real point, the reason I mention that, is that the risk of healthcare workers is high and it's real. Uh, and we, we really do commend them for that. That's also a reason why in Maine and in other states, healthcare workers are an area of focus for us. Uh, it's why we're focused on, for example, getting tests for healthcare workers back so that if they're positive, they can stay home and not affect other people. And if they're negative, they can get back into the health healthcare workforce as quickly as possible. Here's another one that just come in on email. Noting that today was the single largest daily increase in the number of cases, 
Can you say whether you think the virus is actually spreading in Maine or if the CDC is merely discovering more existing infections, especially as the lab chips away at the backlog of tests with a new reagent supply? Very good question. Very good question. In, in any type of outbreak situation, whether it is a respiratory outbreak, a foodborne outbreak, uh, what have you, we are, we are always epidemiologically trying to get a handle uh, and, and try to get a sense of what we see and how that compares to what's really going on out there and trying to narrow that as much as possible. And so there are always different theories out there about whether what we're seeing is a result of something out there changing or just a better, abil a, a better ability to detect it through more testing. In this situation, it, it, it's probably a bit of both. Certainly testing capacity nationwide, as well as in Maine with the addition of commercial laboratories has increased. So that's undoubtedly a part. But we've also detected actual and confirmed community transmission in an expanding number of counties, initially Cumberland, now York. Uh, and so that's not an artifact of testing. That is actual community level transmission, which simultaneously tells us that the virus is spreading largely on its own. So it's a great question. In a sense, it's sort of the $64,000 question when it comes to outbreaks. And in this situation, it's, it's likely to be both. Rosalind Flaherty, do you have a question? Yes. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Are negative COVID-19 test results 100% accurate? Okay. So, Rosalind, this is, this is a good question. Um, I want to I want to discuss accuracy versus the public health implications of a negative. Um, uh, the negative test results are accurate insofar as that what a negative means from a laboratory perspective is that the sample of the specimen, the the sample from a, a patient's nasal swab, what a negative means is that there were no particles of the virus detected in that. And in that regard, the test is extremely accurate. To put it differently, if there were even just a few of the viruses, uh, that's called the limit of detection, even if there were just a few of the viruses in that nasal swab, the test is sensitive enough in it to pick it up. And so a negative tells us a lot about the specimen, but that's it. It just tells us what's going on with the specimen. It doesn't provide us a lot of insight into the patient or the public health implications. So a negative test could mean a couple of different things. It could mean that the patient was never exposed to the virus at all. It could also mean that the patient was just exposed to the virus this morning and that the virus hasn't had time to replicate, to expand in the body and cause illness. It could also mean that the patient has the virus in their body and it is it has expanded, but the patient just doesn't feel sick, but still could transmit it to other people and make other people sick. So again, a negative lab test tells us a lot about the specimen that was submitted, but it doesn't answer the public health question of can this person now go back out and go back to work and rejoin their family? For that, we also need to ask people to stay inside for a longer period of time to see if they develop symptoms. So again, it's a combination. We've got to have the right test, but we also have to have the right time of the test. And that's the, the, the question you ask is right on point because we have to know what a negative means and interpret it uh, and give people advice appropriately. Thank you. Lori from the Bangor Daily News. Lori? Does anybody else have any questions or follow up? Yes, questions? I do. Matt Byrne, Portland Press. Hi there, Dr. Shaw again. Um, Rhode Island's governor has taken the step to ask police to stop people coming into the state with New York license plates, question them, track down New York residents visiting the state, and ask them to self quarantine. Uh, so far, has there been any discussion of tracking interstate travel or identifying people from other states who might be at higher risk if they travel to Maine? Yep. Um, so, Matt, that's uh, I think the you know the governor addressed this uh, when when um, when she was was speaking with everybody um, yesterday. 
Uh, and and I think um, I, I would refer you to her comments there. Uh, I, I I think the governor's view there, uh, as I understood it, is is that uh, people can be warned, people can be asked, but I don't think the governor was indicating that she was going to go further. What I will say uh, is that we're, everything is under discussion, of course, but um, you know the virus is here in Maine. Uh, it has been circulating. We've already had documented community transmission in two counties. Uh, if, if Maine is, is, is uh, any marker based on other, country, uh, other states, we will continue to see community transmission expand on its own. And so from a public health perspective, the virus is already here. And because of the lead up time, that so-called incubation period between when someone is exposed to when they develop symptoms, uh, what that means is that the virus has probably been circulating in Maine for at least two weeks, probably much longer than that. Lori, are you there now? I am. Thank you. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Lori. Okay. Um, Dr. Shaw, could you tell me if there's been any testing of persons in jail or prison and whether or not there's been any testing of uh, people who are experiencing homelessness and what the plans are there? Okay, um, so I'll, I'll take the first, um, and then for the, with respect to the Department of Corrections, um, I, I believe that there have been uh, certain individuals who are in correctional facilities, be they county jails or state facilities, who have been offered or given the test. Uh, there have been no positives, um, and the Department of Corrections has been working with us since we really started uh, m much of our activation over two months ago, the Department of Corrections has been on the table at the table uh, because of our concern for congregate settings. Uh, similarly, with respect to people experiencing homelessness, also a high priority population for us, uh, one that we've been working with uh, with with stakeholders across the state. Uh, the the I, I, with the plans for uh, with respect to individuals who may test positive. Uh, and who may need to be uh, uh, isolated for some time period. Uh, it depends on where they are. Um, there are there are different plans based on where an individual is. It may involve uh, asking folks to or providing folks a hotel. In other situations, it may involve uh, cordoning them off at a part of the facility where they are currently residing if they're in a shelter, uh, et cetera. So there are different contingencies in place. Uh, we recognize fully that uh, anyone in a congregate setting is at a higher risk. Uh, that's one reason that individuals in a, in a congregate setting are among our higher tier for testing because of the public health implications. And we certainly recognize the, the particular challenges that people experiencing homelessness would face, both in accessing the healthcare system and then with any quarantine or isolation requests. So certainly a high concern, uh, and there are a lot of folks who are, are coordinating with that. Thank you. Any last questions? Okay, thank you all for joining us. Right now, the plan is that the next briefing we do will be at 11.30 a.m. Monday, back at the MEMA headquarters over on Commerce Drive. Thank you all, and take care.